Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and welcome to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where we do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Paige, and together we're going to explore magic and spirituality, social justice, psychic realm, and most importantly, what makes us good. Hey friends, and thank you so much for tuning in to episode 56, all about the ancient Egyptian ideals of Mayat, death rituals, and what happens to our souls in the afterlife. Welcome to October. It's Halloween season. I'm pretty excited about it because every year in October, I pick some element of the archetype of, you know, the classic Halloween witch and talk about how it presents itself in our modern practice. And this year I went, you know, a little overboard, and I actually decided to talk about a few things that are often associated with witches, like death, divination, psychic power, and darkness. Today we're going to start at the end. Death. <laughs> Specifically, what happened to the soul after, it, after its body died in the new kingdom of ancient Egypt. So today's episode was inspired by the Amenti Oracle which is based around the cultural value system in place during this period of Egyptian history. It's an interesting deck with, oh my God, like such beautiful artwork, um, and can help you explore some of the concepts we talk about later today. The same day that I received that Oracle deck from Running Press, thanks guys, I also got a copy of Invoke the Goddess by Kayla Trobe from Llewellyn, which explores some goddesses from Hindu, Greek, and Egyptian legends, and I figured that was a pretty clear sign. <laughs> it, it made me laugh, but it's it's cool and it's spooky. So thank you to both publishers. When it comes to death and funeral rituals, there's just never been anyone that takes it as far as the ancient Egyptians. Ritual mummification and booby-trapped pyramids are just like the tip of the iceberg. I'm serious. Uh, <laughs> it's really, really neat. I talked a little about the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead in a previous episode about magical books. And today, we're, we're going to expand on that just a little bit and, and dive in a little more in depth. So there is no one master copy of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. This was a book that was created and recreated for each individual person who was buried with one. And it served as a guide so that their specific soul could find its way through the trials and tribulations of the journey through the afterlife and provide them with the spells and the information that they'd need to pass every test. The most well-preserved copy in existence is known as the Papyrus of Ani, a scribe from Thebes. Which again, I did talk about in that episode. I believe it's in the British Museum because a, a British explorer definitely stole it. <laughs> Chopped it up and stole it. Um, but it is in the, the British Museum and um, it's just stunning. It's so, so detailed. So every single book of the dead is going to be different depending on the person, you know, who's doing the dying. But one spell that all of them share is spell number 125 which concerns the weighing of the heart and the confessions of sin. The Egyptians believed that our souls were eternal, as long as we focused our lives on living according to divine laws and in peace with each other. The soul lived in the heart, and so the heart was always left with the dead during mummification so that they could present their heart for the weighing at their trial. But we're not quite there yet. After death, the first figure you'd encounter is the Lord of the Dead and God of Mummification, Anubis, the jackal-headed god. Anubis would guide you forward to your trial and the weighing of your heart which was presided over by Osiris, the Lord of the Underworld and the Judge of the Dead. And also, and there are a million ways to pronounce this name and there's no officially right way, I just want to remind you all of that, uh, Thoth, Thought, or Thot, it depends who you are the god of writing, magic, divine wisdom, and the moon. Thought is also reputed to be the original creator of the entire system of tarot cards, all of the symbolism. So he's a big deal. <laughs> he's a pretty big deal. Uh, so during your trial, you would surrender your heart to the gods so that it could be weighed against the feather of truth, belonging to the goddess Mayette. Then you would recite the 42 negative confessions to the 42 judges from various physical and metaphysical areas of Egypt. The 42 confessions were different for everyone because 
sin is different for everyone, right? And the big part of reciting the confessions is that you're truthful with the judges and with yourself. You have to truly believe what it is that you confess and truly believe in your goodness. So the judges also debated your intentions and and your place in life and what your decisions meant for their particular part of Egypt, whether it was physical or not. And and it was different. You know, there was there was context that mattered in all of your confessions. So, for example, a farmer could truthfully say, I have not slain men and women, but a soldier really couldn't. But is that necessarily a sin if that's the soldier's job? There is always room to provide context, of course. So you might have noticed that the number 42 comes up a little bit. This is a a sacred number in Egypt and actually kind of all over the place. Uh, If you are as big of a nerd as I am, you definitely read it or heard it in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 42 was said to be the answer to everything or life, the universe and everything. And this number is actually seen all throughout different religions in the world. And ancient Egypt is one of them. It was a number of power and totality and also of universal law. So there are 42 confessions and they're different for every single person. Now, our most well-known version of the Book of the Dead is the Papyrus of Ani. So some of Ani's confessions were, I have not committed sin, which was number one. This is number one for most people. And then we have number eight, I have not uttered lies. And this is one where your intentions would be debated among the 42 judges, because what counts as a lie and what counts as purposefully telling a lie with the intention to deceive, all of that is very different. Number 21 I liked because it's, I have not debauched the wives of other men. He also put, I have never debauched someone else's wife, and I have never committed adultery, and I'm thinking that Ani doth protest a little too much when it comes to debauching. (laughs) Um, And another one that I really liked was, I have not shut my ears to the truth. Truth was a big part of this ceremony, obviously. The feather that your heart is weighed against to to prove if your confessions are good and just is the feather of truth. (laughs) And Mat is the goddess of truth and justice and balance. Another one that was interesting was I have not worked witchcraft against the king. And this could be any version of I've not stolen from the king. I have not stolen from the state. I have not taken things out of the mouths of others or from my own people. They're neat, right? So if your heart was lighter than the feather of truth, that meant you were honest and you worked hard to live your life according to the divine laws, the laws set out by the Egyptian gods. And you would get to go on to a pleasant afterlife, a very nice and lovely afterlife. In some legends, there were some further trials. And in other ones, this was the very last one. And if you passed, you could walk across the lily lake into the field of reeds, which is their their concept of, of heaven, basically. Now, <laughs> let's say that you weren't perfect. And <laughs> if you came into the afterlife with a heart heavy of sin for which you were not willing to atone, your heart, and thus your soul, was devoured by the crocodile-headed god Emmet. And for a people who believed in eternal life, the prospect of suddenly ceasing to exist was terrifying. In this ancient Egyptian belief, when you crossed over into the field of reeds, your life was not over and you did not just sit around. In this world, you got to coexist with the gods. You got to study more about enlightenment and spirituality, and you got to become a star and contribute to the light and enlightenment of the rest of the universe. So it was a big deal to not get that part. That was a big part. So the goddess Mat, um, or Mayat, the owner of the feather of truth, presided over harmony, justice, truth, and balance. The ethical values of the Egyptian society at the time came to be known as the principles of Mat. Mat was not just a goddess, but it was an entire way of life. 
Mat is one of the oldest Egyptian deities there are. She was said to be born at the very beginning of time when the sun god Ra spoke the world into creation. And through the power of Heka, or magic, Mat was created to bring balance and justice to all people. The ancient Egyptians believed very, very strongly that every individual was responsible for his or her own life. And that life should be lived with other people and with the earth in mind. In the same way that the gods cared for humanity, so should humans care for each other and for the earth. You know, it's a great gift to be provided with everything the earth provides for us. And you can't go through life ignoring other people and ignoring the state of the planet. This is especially important right now with all of the... (sighs) let's say discussions, (laughs) all of the fights about the very real threat of climate change. Uh, Denying climate change and denying the effect this has on other people in the world, or just denying that that matters as much as your life or your convenience, is definitely not in line with the principles of Mott. And those motherfuckers are just going to get eaten by a big old crocodile in the afterlife. Just you wait. Just you wait. I hope that makes you feel better. (laughs) So to live in accordance with these beliefs was to be was said to be living according to the principles of Mott, and this would grant you the privilege of moving on to the field of reeds in the afterlife. This is a super universal concept, right? This is this is just the story of religion. So Religions and spiritualities all over the world have a similar process when it comes to death. Now, the Egyptians wrote an entire guidebook so that those individual souls could find their way. They carved symbols onto their sarcophagi. They came up with mummification to help preserve the heart and preserve the body of the dead so that they could move through their afterlife properly. It was all set up to make sure that the next phase of their eternal life went smoothly or went the way it was supposed to. Mostly it was meant to prepare you for that so that you could, again, take responsibility for your actions and your choices. So the field of reeds past this beautiful lake of lilies uh, is described in a lot of the same ways as heaven and the Elysian fields in ancient Greece. You know, life is beautiful, but life is hard. And throughout this life, you're going to lose things and people and opportunities all along the way that that are really going to matter to you. Now, you shouldn't carry that regret with you in your heart. And part of the reason for that is that in the field of reeds, you reunite with all that you had to lose or sacrifice in your in this first phase of your life, the living phase of life. Um, all the people, all of the knowledge, all of that. You get to live on forever with the gods in peace and harmony and continue to learn the secrets of divinity. You can become a star and share your light and enlightenment with the world from there. And you get to continually contribute to the magic and the energy and the balance of the universe. Again, this is so universal. And I think that's what um, I like about it is that this is, this is very old. (laughs) So the Egyptian book of the dead predates Jesus by like a couple thousand years. It might only be like 1800, but it's a couple thousand years. Um, So, and it's not like, I don't like the idea that all religions stole from each other. I think it's more that these are archetypes. These are archetypal images and stories and beliefs and feelings that all human beings share. They're kind of, they're universal. They belong to all of us. So the ceremony, the heart weighing ceremony on these golden scales and the principles of Mott are the main inspiration behind the Amenti Oracle deck by Jennifer Sodini. Um, and the artist is Natalie Miller that I mentioned earlier. Super cool deck. Very interesting. The deck consists of 42 cards. You know, there's 42 confessions. And they're based on some of the negative confessions recited during, as noted in multiple Egyptian books of the dead. Because Anis is not the only one we have. It's just the most complete. Instead of they being 
Negative confessions, they've been transformed into positive statements that are like affirmations. You're still alive, right? You can't just say, I never did this yet, because you've still got a place to go. So these positive affirmations allow you to embody these ideals going forward to make sure that your afterlife goes well. This deck is really, really interesting. And I'm going to start with what I really loved about the deck because there's some stuff I didn't, but I'm going to start with what I loved. The art in this deck is absolutely fucking fantastic. Like I cannot say enough nice things about the art. The symbolism on the cards is beautiful. The art is really, really, really cool, really interesting, uh, obviously incredibly well thought out. Even the backs of the cards, they have this kind of neon thread vibe that is at once very modern and also very um, like an ancient concept, you know, the thread of life. So I, I thought that was really cool. The colors, some of which are incredibly muted or understated, are still super bold because of the way that the cards are designed. They're so full of symbolism. It Just like a classic tarot or oracle deck, you have to look in every single corner of that Um, that image on your card to get the full view of what it is that you're looking at. I love the card stock. I mean, it's just, honestly, they're beautiful cards. I love everything about the cards themselves. And I have found a lot of success using them for things like my daily draws in the morning, especially if it's just one card for something that I really need to focus on this day or a positive ideal that I need to embody for whatever it is I'm coming up against today, right? Unfortunately, I did struggle a little bit with the guidebook. (laughs) Oh man, I struggled more than a little and I feel like kind of bad about it, but also kind of not. Now, I don't do, I don't do a lot of negative reviews, mostly because, oh my God, decks and books, people's art is so subjective, you know, and just because It didn't resonate with me or it didn't work for me or I didn't like it. It doesn't mean it's actually bad. So I often feel like giving any sort of negative review is not useful. But I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the problems I had with this deck because I think it's kind of important. So I'm a pretty straightforward person. (laughs) Capricorn, right? I love breaking rules. But in order to break those rules, I first need to know what the hell they are. I like to follow the recipe the first time. You know, I have already read and reread the instruction manual for whatever IKEA thing we're building, and I know the rules to the board game, but I'm still going to hold them in my hand and reference them at least twice throughout this game. (laughs) Especially Monopoly. I've been playing this game my whole life. It's a million years old, and I still have to have the rules in my hand every time. So this deck is is very open-ended. Uh, in the book, she she says that this is not necessarily an oracle for divination in, in the way of kind of traditional oracle decks. It's more for um, exploring the self. And that is a very, again, subjective topic. So I had kind of a hard time with how open-ended a lot of the card descriptions were. The book is gorgeous. It's it, like it's a great book. It's really well put together. It's illustrated, it's colorful, it's really pretty. A little bit of a problem with page numbers, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, But some of the entries in the book, uh, many actually, gave me more than a knife to, to decipher the meaning of the card, and others, not so much. There are still some cards in here that I just, I just cannot figure out. I just can't figure them the hell out. And it doesn't matter how many times I read the entry in the book, it's just not sinking into my brain. It just, that's my brain, right? Part of this is no doubt my love for boundaries that I can then cross, right? I love my rules. Um, But another, I don't know, it's not really a a roadblock. It's a positive and, and a challenge when it comes to this deck. And I realized it when I was writing this episode. It's how individual each of these confessions need to be. So when you're making a deck, you need to pick 42 confessions that could apply to everyone. As we learned, every single Egyptian book of the dead is completely different. 
The sins that you have to confess at the end of your life are going to be different than other people's. Even the way that that sin applied to your life or, um, you know, your intentions behind it, all of that is going to be completely, completely different. So the cards have to be pretty open-ended so that they can be open to everybody. And I'm glad I realized that while I was while I was researching this episode, because that has helped quite a bit to remember that each one of these confessions still has to be, you know, rung through the perspective of my own life and my experiences and, and my beliefs and things like that. So I can't get too hung up on the meanings in the cards. I can't get too hung up on having a guidebook that just gives me strict, <laughs> strict, like point form notes, right? I can't, can't have that with this kind of concept. So, I'm struggling a little bit. It's it's a little hard. But I love the cards so much that I am going to keep using them. And I've started kind of making up my own key or guidebook, you know, grabbing post-its and making little notes on individual pages and with certain cards so that I remember some of the things that come up when I'm doing an intu- intuitive reading. You know, some of the things that have popped into my head when I've read these cards before or other times when I've found this card or, you know, whatever. Um, another problem I had is that the, the language, though it's beautifully written, is very mystical and very esoteric. Um, and at times I couldn't actually figure out what the real world action or situation that would actually fit the affirmation on the card is. Like I can't, <laughs> some of them are very, very self-explanatory. And we're going to go through three of them in, in a minute. I picked a few. Some of them are self-explanatory. Like I act respectfully of others. That's pretty Self-explanatory, right? Uh, And then you have others like, I keep the waters pure, which has to do with a lot of Egyptian symbolism. It requires a little bit of, you know, (laughs) just a little bit of um, research along with your your intuition. Um, And then there are other cards that will be very, very different and could be kind of a challenge for you, depending on what it is that you are reading and the things that you believe. Uh, One card in particular that I struggle with is I hold purity in high esteem. And what I'm struggling with is, I I mean, it's a beautiful card. The symbolism is mostly pretty easy to follow, but it does have the chakras in it. And she really synthesized the chakra system and stuff about ancient Egypt. And I just, I just didn't love it. I didn't find it that helpful especially because she was associating certain sacred oils with certain chakras and like they don't add up and it it just didn't add up for me I had a hard time with that um I had a hard time with that card especially because the concept of purity can be a real challenge to some of us but in the book she explains that if you hear the word purity and you instantly think of some of those more um negative and limiting boundaries of you know, whatever religious morality that's been foisted on us. That's not what this card is about. It's about clearing your chakras and balancing them. It's about making sure that you are taking care of your body, that you are getting rid of the things that you no longer need, that you are shedding the things that you no longer need, and that you are building up your body and yourself, physical and metaphysical, building up that self to be the the best version of yourself that you can. So once I I got the hang of that, (laughs) it was a little easier. Um, But I I did struggle with the whole, the the chakra things in there. That was a little too much. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is I would have liked a little more balanced combination of the really pretty esoteric writing and then the easy to begin to digest because it's they're broad concepts um points with like a real world example or tie back and in some i I totally got that like some are not only self-explanatory on the card but the the section she has that explains it is fantastic uh many include egyptian proverbs which are so so interesting the one thing the book is great at is teaching you more about Mayette and the principles and, and their place in the value system of ancient Egypt, the ways that they saw it and the ways that they would try to embody these ideals in their everyday life. 
Like I said, the book is full color. It's illustrated. It's beautiful. I love the Egyptian proverbs. There's also quotes from the the Emerald Tablet, which is a whole other thing. Um, <laughs> and some reference tarot cards, which was super, super helpful for me. I love tarot cards, right? And some cards just smack me in the face with the same vibe as a particular tarot card. Uh, one card in here looked so much like the High Priestess that... I ran and I, you know, I fetched <laughs> the Rider weight version of the High Priestess and I held them side by side. And because I'm so familiar with that energy and with all the ideas that are, you know, a part of that card and a part of the High Priestess, I was able to understand a little bit more of what she was saying in the, the Amenti book because of those associations. Other cards were related to other tarot cards or the lessons in tarot cards. And I really, really liked that as well. It just gave me something I, something to, something to jump off of, a jumping off point. I, I, I kind of need that. So I don't want to sound like I'm giving this deck a bad review because I am absolutely not. I'm in love with these cards. I love the art. I love touching them. I love the card stock. And I, I really love the overall core concept of the deck. I love it. I, I had never, I had heard about the, the weighing heart ceremony, but I had never, um, I had never heard about the ideals, the, the confessions and the different concepts of sin and the different, um, contexts <laughs> of sin. I had never heard that part before. And I think it's just a, a really it's a beautiful set of ideals, no matter what time that you live in. It's all about helping and respecting other people and connecting to both your spiritual side and your physical side and doing what's best for yourself and the world around you. And that's beautiful. Um, the packaging is, is great. I mean, it's not just the cards in the book that are great. It comes in a really nice book with a magnet closure. Awesome. Um, and it's clear that the guidebook, even when I struggled with it, was written with a lot of passion and love for the subject. And from what I can tell so far, most of what I read about the, about Mott, about the ideas, the ideals about the Feather Heart Ceremony is very legit, very legit. Um, it's clear that the people who created this deck really, really... Like, it, like I said, there was a lot of passion and love for the subject, for the deck itself, and for everything about it. And you can really feel that through it. I'm a tarot card reader for a reason. See, this is, I don't have a lot of oracle decks. And the ones that I do are often, um, the advice on them is very real world. So it's things like, you need to get out and move. You need to eat this kind of food. You need to connect with this chakra instead. Maybe try casting a spell for this. Um, and I, I like those, but I don't use them all the time. I use the tarot cards because that symbolism and the boundaries and limits, I guess, somehow provide my intuition with a little more freedom to explore. I think it's because when it's more open-ended, I feel overwhelmed and I, I can't find any one single thing to focus on. And it's becoming more and more common for Oracle cards to be more open-ended, to be more open to your intuition, your interpretations, and all of that. A lot of decks now aren't even coming with books that have the descriptions. You can find that on the website, and otherwise you're just going to have to go with your gut. And I think that that's really, really cool, but I also think that that's super hard for me. <laughs> oh, I'm a true Capricorn. True Capricorn. Um... So I love the tarot, but I, I really did love the Amenti Oracle. I, I, oh man, I can see myself using these cards all the time. And the statements on them, these affirmations are actually things that I would say to myself, actually things that I would focus on throughout the day, actually things that would work into my spiritual practice. So I really liked that. Spooky Things Magazine is a brand new curated monthly art zine containing work from well-known and emerging artists from all over. The subject matter is all in spooky fun and perfect for any witchy art lover. 
Head to SpookyThingsZine.com and get yourself a copy of the brand new number one first edition of Spooky Things, which is, of course, Halloween themed. You can also get a copy that comes with extra stickers, limited edition buttons, and gifts from the creator of the zine, also known as Peaceful Pagan Person on Instagram. Peaceful Pagan Person also has an incredible Etsy shop where you can get tarot readings, witch bottles and balls, resin artwork that has real flowers and herbs worked right in, as well as a whole bunch of other really, really fun, spooky stuff for your home and your practice. Every day is Halloween in Spooky Things magazine, so head to SpookyThingsZine.com and get yourself a copy today. I obviously can't get in depth into every single card. So I chose three and I I did it just like a reading. I intuitively chose three to introduce you to the cards, the guidebook and and the ideas. And I'll I'll post photos um, on my website. But I chose these with the intention of delivering messages to anyone that comes across this podcast episode. What is it that you need to hear? So the first card I drew is number 32, which is on page 98 of the book, if you have it, which is I follow my inner guidance. And right away, the symbols on this card are so, so fantastic. They really paint a picture. A few things that jump out are the color purple. The the character on the card has purple hair. You see the presence of a third eye on her forehead, right where that would be. And her earrings she has four that are the elemental symbols, the, the alchemical elemental symbols, the triangles, and one that looks like the Libra symbol, which makes a lot of sense because Mott, Mott is actually a perfect topic now that we are right in the heart of Libra season because it, it focuses on those same ideals of balance and justice. So I follow my inner guidance beautiful card. Obviously, it touches on intuition, on using your psychic um, senses, and on approaching that with fairness and by looking at the entire picture. Here's a little bit from the book. The six integral faculties of mind are believed to be reason, memory, perception, will, imagination, and intuition. The mind's faculties are its metaphorical chess pieces, which assist in strategic navigation over the chessboard of waking life. Now it goes on to obviously talk about all of these mental faculties. <coughs> but let's go down to this main theme that I'm seeing, which is imagination and intuition. Imagination is king, the creative potential which allows us to build our castles in the sky through the power of the mind's eye. With this aptitude of insight, We allow will to be the pawn which captures the reality we wish to claim. Finally, the queen to our king of imagination is our power of intuition as the universal language of feeling, the synthesis of emotion and insight, foresight met with strategy. Intuition in conjunction with all other working parts of the conscious mind brings total awareness, and through cultivation of awareness and the ideal of inner guidance, We are led to deepening of awareness of self and the self-strategic relationship to the totality of the all. So the message there is to follow and to trust your inner guidance, to tap into your intuition and to trust the symbols and messages that you receive through there. The next is card number 27, which is on page 85 in the book. And this is, I am open to love in various forms. I really liked um, this card because it shows it shows um, how modern the influences were behind the design of the cards. So the person that you see on this I am open to love in various forms is a person of no specific gender, and they are holding five varieties of flower to their heart. Um, when I look at it, what I can see is papyrus, which is, of course is Egyptian. They used it for paper. Uh, I see a poppy. I see a lotus. I think those are violets, small little purple violets, African violets. And, you know, that might be amaranth. 
Love Lies Bleeding. It's it's red and it's kind of a cone. And I've seen it in other cards as well. I should look that up a little bit more. But those are the those are the five flowers I can kind of make out there. So you might want to look up some of the language of flowers to see what that means. Um, the colors are soft and bright and the design is really simple, but it sends a really beautiful message. I'm open to love in various forms. It's not just about romantic love. That is not the only type of love, though for some people it really feels like that. And actually, if you're a Libra, it probably feels like that all the time. Libras are the sign that are notoriously obsessed with romantic relationships. And today is my Libra friend's birthday. Well, today when the episode comes out, so October 3rd, is my Libra friend's birthday. And he is very much a true Libra and a little obsessed with the relationships, the romantic relationships. Um, but I like the message behind this card. Love is something that is elemental, ever present and entangled in many different forms and feelings. The simplest and most, com most complex seed of creative force, the various forms of love within a lifetime are in an infinitely evolving action, motion, subject, object, and understanding. Love is something that can be found and can become us. It is a being and a doing and the indivisible, invisible, <laughs> that takes root in the heart. Embracing I am open to love in various forms is about understanding, remembering, and embodying love's elements and transitions. It is the deep connection to love as an awareness to become and a detachment from love as a prize to be won or a thing to be attained. While soulmates may be found along the path into being, the idealized human understands that each soul met is a match to the spirit of this embodied ideal and love is the superlative state of matter imbued with meaning. Uh, and being open to love in various forms means always, always be willing to both give and receive love. You know, if you are giving love all the time, and that doesn't sound like a bad thing, right? But if you're giving love all the time and you are not allowing yourself to be loved in return, that is, that is a problem. That is one of these sins because it doesn't take the feelings and um, the feelings and emotions of others into account, which is part of the ideals of Mott. It's also about realizing that love is the ultimate force, the ultimate goal in life, not just romantic love, but loving all people, loving the planet, loving yourself. All of these are very, very important. And the last one I pulled is actually like probably one of my favorite ones in the deck. It's number 13, of course, um, it's on page 49, but it's number 13 and it's, I honor animals with reverence. Ah, <laughs> I love it. And because it is based on ancient Egypt, you better believe that there is a big fancy Egyptian cat on this card. So it features a really, really badass woman, um, with her fancy Egyptian cat who was in a very like regal and protective stance wearing the jewelry and a, and a shawl and just so cool. It even has a little eyeliner. <laughs> I love cats with eyeliner. Um, so the full moon is behind them while a snake looks on from above and small, a small pink bird floats right above the hand of the woman here with her cat. And I love this because it shows an appreciation for all different kinds of animals. You know, birds are important and as are cats, but it, an animal doesn't have to be our pet. It doesn't have to submit to us um, to be valuable. It, it doesn't even have to not kill us to be valuable. <laughs> There's a place for all these animals on the planet. So it says here, in ancient Egypt, cats were held in high esteem and treated with great care. Royalty would dress their feline companions in golden adornments and happily allowed them to eat off their plates. These sacred creatures helped protect the community food supply by fighting off mice and cobras. Cobras! So cool. Um, and punishment for harming a feline was incredibly severe. Bastet, the Egyptian goddess often represented as half feline, half woman, was worshipped as the safeguard of the pharaoh, the keeper of women's secrets, the goddess of home and childbirth, and the protectress of felines and their caretakers. <laughs> I love it. In embodying the ideal of treating all animals with reverence, we find a vision of every life as something to be cherished and a magic behind every life force, no matter how big or, ho or how small. 
through observation of and respect for the unique characteristics of each individual animal spirit, we can allow the opportunity to relate to and apply the archetypal energy each embodies to the fractal design of our soul's personality. In removing the ephemeral mask of the human ego, we are left with the perennial wisdom within the anima mundi, or world soul, the intrinsic invisible spirit that permeates all life. And this is, of course, one of my favorites. Um, this ideal can obviously be interpreted in a thousand different ways. Uh, it can be not eating meat or using animal products uh, because you, you feel like that's wrong. That can be one way to live this ideal. Um, some people who still hunt for food will say prayers of gratitude for the animal that has died. Uh, others will care for animals in life, you know, they'll they'll foster kittens like a friend of mine does all the time, all the time. She has a new crop of kittens like every two months and it's heartbreaking and it's beautiful and I love her for it. So she, <laughs> so she fosters kittens. Other people will um, start up entire animal rescues or shelters or just volunteer at their local shelters. Many will bring cats and dogs into their home if they have enough space and some become teachers to teach children and people and everyone. How cool. <laughs> I think animals are cool. How cool and how important all animals are to life and the universe and our existence. So those are a few of the cards in the, the deck. Remember that there's 42. So I just chose three, mostly because that's a magical number, but also because I think it, it shows you a little bit about a little bit about the deck, a little bit about the ideals, and it gives you something to think about. I'm really starting to open up to the idea of a more open interpretation of these cards. I have to remember to really, really apply my own beliefs and values and, and experiences to the card. I love the idea of considering what my own confessions might be at the end of my life. You know, what are my values and ideals? What do I consider that makes me good? What do I consider that makes me bad? I think this deck is a really, really cool way to explore that, um, especially with the help of a, a journal. This is, if you are someone who likes to use divination methods in any way, you know, cards, runes, what have you, as journal prompts, this is a very interesting deck for that because you have beautiful symbolism, you have these affirmations that you can carry around or say with you all day, and it gives you a lot to think about and to write down and to consider about yourself. So I really liked it. It's the Amenti Oracle by Jennifer Sodini, and it was put out by Running Press. So I do recommend checking it out. So to help me understand a little bit more about Mott and about some of the other ancient Egyptian gods, because I will admit I only knew some of the basics. <laughs> There's just so much. So cool, though. Um, so like I said, Invoke the Goddess by Kayla Trobe came in at the same time. And when I saw it, and I saw that Mott was one of the, or Mayat, sorry, I just keep pronouncing it Mott. Um, when I saw that Mayat was one of the goddesses in here, I, I got pretty excited, right? So I read this book while working with the Amenti Oracle to help me understand some of these concepts a little bit more. So this book actually highlights five goddesses from each ancient Greek and Hindu mythology and religion. I honestly really liked it. I thought it was so, so cool. I thought it was a really interesting book. My only complaint obviously, is the very glaring omission of Bast the Cat Goddess from the Egyptian section. <laughs> like, I'm so mad about it. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's okay. Um, in, in the Egyptian section, we have Isis, Nephthys, Hathor, Mayet, and Sekhmet. Now, Sekhmet is, you know, a lion-headed goddess, but it's just not the same. A little bummed about that. And I think it's weird because Bast has got to be the god, the Egyptian goddess that the most, that most people recognize a little bit, the name of anyways. But other than that, <laughs> which is not even really a real issue, I was just bummed. Um, I really, really loved this book. You might be wondering at this point, oh, but Paige, you talk about being a secular witch all the time. Why would you love a book about deities? Why would you read a book about deities? And I think I've mentioned it a million times now, but I'm going to keep doing it. 
is because I truthfully really love stories. I love stories. Ah, oh, I love stories. My mom was a big reader when we were kids, and she read to us before bed, and she read us just about everything. But my mom, like me, really loves these morality tales type stories, stories that teach you something in the end. So even though I was never raised as a Christian, I grew up hearing and knowing all of the Bible story, like the Old Testament. Yo, I know. <laughs> I love a lot of the stories in the Old Testament um, and the ones that took place in Egypt, you know, Moses, Passover. Uh, those were often some of my favorites. I also read Aesop's Fables religiously, humongous book, a tome of Aesop's Fables. Uh, I read it so many times that it, it fell apart. And I loved the morals of the story at the end. I loved them. They taught me so much about me and about life, and they, they really made me think. And then I developed my love of Greek mythology pretty early because the 90s were the era of Xena. <laughs> Xena and Hercules, right? Um, and that continued to blossom to in include all other mythologies. So I love stories. I love finding the similarities and the differences between these stories and between the people in them and between the ways that these stories would play out in different cultures and in different parts of the planet. All these gods are personifications of magical ideas or concept or even just the ways of the world. You know, Zeus is the god of lightning because they needed a way to explain where lightning came from, why it came down at that time, why it struck certain things. It allows all people to relate to anything, to relate to the planet and the earth on a personal level, on an equal level. There is so, so much to learn and be inspired by in religious stories from, from anywhere, from every single culture. There is something amazing and beautiful and artistic and important to learn. Now, that's not to say you should feel entitled to using or changing um, the traditions of other cultures without accountability. You know, for example, do not read this book, um, you know, with five Hindu goddesses in it as a white person and proclaim yourself a Hindu and uh, these are your only five goddesses, right? Don't do stuff like that. There has to be personal responsibility and accountability, just like the ancient Egyptians believed. But learning is always welcome always welcome. Check out a book, learn a little something, and there's nothing wrong with that. So every chapter focuses on a different goddess. It tells you their story and their place in legend, and then it provides you with information on working with them in your practice and a visualization exercise that you can use to either connect with the goddess or to, you know, harness that energy into your life or your practice. So chapter nine is about our girl Mayette and the visualization is meant to help you weigh out different options to make a balanced choice. And this visualization exercise, of course, features the golden scales and she recommends choosing symbols that represent a couple of choices that you, you know, you're trying to choose between a few things. Choose symbols that represent each one. And I think the cards in the Amenti Oracle are actually really perfect for that. You know, you can pick a card that looks like you or that stands out for some reason or the confession on the card might be something that you have been thinking about a lot or that is part of the reason you're considering this particular um, choice. And then in your visualization, you are going to weigh out your choices. And I think the cards are a really good addition to that visualization exercise. So I was particularly impressed with the chapters on Artemis and Hecate in the Greek section. Now, Greek mythology is something I know a little bit about. So that was actually the one I started with. <laughs> Despite being interested in the Egyptian, uh, I went to the Greek first to just kind of, it was a way to gauge if the book was well written. And let me tell you, it is. Every chapter has a story or a poem right at the beginning that, you know, shows you something about the goddess in question or that tells you a little bit about her, her vibe, her energy. And the one for Artemis, the virgin goddess of the moon and the hunt, was something else. And I have posted some of it to Instagram. Uh, 
it goes on and on and on. If I could read the whole thing right now, I absolutely would. But there's a part that I want to share. <laughs> be warned, all ye who would sin against women and hold my daughters in contempt. Ye shall be hunted down like quarry and thrown to the dogs. Be warned, all women who ally yourselves with wrongful forces, even those of you who call yourselves my daughters. Treat your own kind with respect, or you shall be doubly punished." For I am Artemis, who shoots from afar and never misses. From me, though you may dodge behind trees and linger in tangled thicket, there is no hope of escape, for the pursuit of the uncivilized is my sport and my only pleasure. Ain't that some shit? Like, that, <laughs> I, I, I got so fired up when I was reading it. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. I loved the addition of, of talking about not just, you know, those who hurt or don't value women, but also the women who have internalized this and the damage that that can do to other people. I thought that was awesome. So cool. Um, in every section, there is a, a small poem or a bit of story. And those have to be my, my favorite section of every single chapter because I love the stories. Uh, Hecate's chapter was really, really great. And the visualization exercise is to help you over overcome prejudice because Hecate is the protector of outcasts. You know, she was, she was an odd duck, that one, but in all of the best ways, you know, she was actually a, a Titan, a Titan goddess who was very much revered by the younger gods who had wiped out the other Titans, right? Zeus thought she was just the bee's knees and gave her dominion over all sorts of things. Um, earth and land and magic she works with the moon she's the goddess of the crossroads she has so many jobs <laughs> uh and she is the protector of outcasts and the visualization was really really beautiful and then kali's chapter near the beginning of the book in the hindu section features a visualization for ending cycles of abuse so the book is filled with really really cool empowering moments, um, especially for, you know, it's a fat feminist witch, man. This is a great book to work your love of stories and your meditation and magical practice with your, I don't know, your beliefs and your ideals as a feminist. We're talking a lot about beliefs and ideals today, aren't we? So I found the book really fit in with a lot of that. And it was really, really interesting. I love the stories and it was inspirational. The energy of these goddesses is something that you can work into your magic without having to worship anything. You can be inspired. You can incorporate their images, their sacred tools, their incenses, and you can tell their stories and find the elements of magical truth hidden within. So this weekend, as you're going about your lovely October business, I would like you to think about what some of your confessions would be when you made your way to the afterlife. What would you say as you handed over your heart and as the scales of justice weighed it with the ostrich feather of truth, do you think that your heart would be light enough to make it through? Do you think heaviness in your heart that was maybe not caused by intentional sin do you think that that could hold you back let me tell you it won't uh <laughs> and do you ever focus on these any of these specific ideals and morals and values and ethics as a way to extend your spiritual life that's what i want you to think about this weekend so we started in with death but i think we kept it a little light and breezy today now, October is it, right? October is it. And we are going to be talking about spooky stuff all month. Today we talked about death and the weighing of our heart. Next week we are talking about my baby, tarot. Now, if you saw the event, some of it will be different. I unfortunately could not get all of the books I had planned to review read in time. Read and tested, right? Especially when it comes to tarot books. I like to test them out and, you know, make sure I'm really getting it, work with my cards a little bit, do the exercises. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. So I won't be talking about tarot for troubled times or querying the tarot next week, but I will be getting to them before the end of the year. That's my promise to you guys, because everyone wants me to review these and I don't blame you. Um, but I am still going to be talking about tarot, about the history, about some of the symbolism. I've got a different tarot book or tarot books to talk to you about, to recommend. 
Um, and we're going to come back a little bit to our Egyptian legend, and we are going to talk about Thought and his role in the symbolism of the tarot, and then Aleister Crowley's role in <laughs> exposing his symbolism in the tarot. So that'll be a really fun episode uh, next week. So I hope you guys can tune into that on Thursday, October 12th. Tomorrow, Friday, October 4th, be sure to check out my website, thefatfeministwitch.com, to see my update for the Fat Witch Fall playlist. There was not an update last week, unfortunately, but this week I've got something really, really great, really fun planned, and I've got a whole big handful of songs to hopefully help you ruminate over some of these subjects this weekend. Balance, justice, witchcraft. <laughs> All of that fun stuff because there was a ton of witchcraft and magic in that Egyptian, in that Egyptian story, wasn't there? So cool. So thank you all so much for tuning into the podcast today. If you want to find out a little bit more about me, you can go to my website, thefatfeministwitch.com. You can also find me all across social media. Just search Fat Feminist Witch. You can search the hashtags Fat Witch Fall um, to find more of the things I'm posting throughout Instagram or, or the things people are saying in response to some of the shows here. If you want to contribute financially to the show, you can do that by going to patreon.com and signing up for the private monthly membership group called The Witch and Bitch, which is 10 bucks a month. And we do live meetups. We have books that we read every month. Um, this well, actually, it's every two months. It's a cycle. Right now, we're reading Honoring Your Ancestors by Mallory Vaudoise and talking about death, of course. <laughs> it's spooky season. It's time. <laughs> you can also go to my website and click the button that says Buy Me a Coffee to make a small little one-time donation. And if you are a writer or you create witchy products or you have a product that you think might help or contribute good things to my listeners and you want to advertise on the Fat Feminist Witch, you can do that by going to advertisecast.com slash Fat Feminist Witch. And of course, liking, subscribing, sharing, all of that, super appreciated and really does help my show grow. <laughs> Have a very fantastic spooky October weekend, everybody. And, uh, you know, happy birthday to all those October Libras out there who are coming into their element right now. <laughs> I know you're just loving it. And if anyone is going to focus on the scales of justice and balance and truth, it's you. Don't let me down. 